Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and in this video, I'm going to give you a teacher's guide to scientific inquiry. This is not just one video. It's a bunch of resources together. There'll be five additional videos. We'll dig more deeply into the five steps of inquiry. I've got some inquiry cards that you can use. They've got fronts and backs as a guide. I've got posters you could use in the classroom. There's graphic organizers. There's a website, The Wonder of Science, that will lead you through all of this. And so this is not just one-off video. This is a framework that you can use to do scientific inquiry. It's just one model, but it's a model that's worked for me. Before we get into that, we should really talk about what scientific inquiry is. It's just simply what scientists do. They ask questions, they answer those questions, which leads to more questions, and it's how they understand the natural world. You might not be familiar with that, but you're probably familiar with regular inquiry. That's where you are curious about something and you answer your questions. Maybe you don't understand how a new set of standards work or a new bit of science works. So you ask questions and then you answer those questions. Just watching this video is an example of inquiry. But when you're teaching through scientific inquiry, you have to realize that all your students are going to be at many different levels. Some of them, this is brand new to them, and some of it, it's just a form of education that they haven't seen before. So you have to know that there's a continuum. It goes from super structured to super free when it comes to inquiry, and neither of these is right. You want to build up students' capacity in inquiry before you really let them go. You also want to make sure that you, the inquiry you're doing is anchoring in some phenomena, some set of standards, otherwise you're going to waste time. And so in my work, we're working with schools as they start to do inquiry, I'm asked oftentimes to do lab sites. What I'm doing there is I'm teaching a lesson and then a bunch of other teachers are watching me do that lesson. The first thing I'll always do when they ask me to teach a lesson is say, what standards do you want me to address? So the example I'll give here is a fourth grade unit. This is on energy and energy in collisions using the next generation science standards. It's really important that I understand what the standards are because now I have to decide what's the phenomena that I'm going to use. In this case, I'm going to use the wonder spheres. That's not their name. I created that name so you don't Google what this demonstration is. And I think that's an important lesson for you and for students. Just Googling the answer to a question is not inquiry. You're just looking up somebody else's answers. And so you really want to find phenomena where the students are in the position of a scientist. In this case, we have these two spheres and uh, they feel the same. They feel like they have the same weight. Uh, they feel like they have the same density. Um, they feel like uh, just a regular Super Bowl is what they feel like. But when you um, drop them on a surface, you get this odd behavior. And so what we now have is a phenomena. A phenomena is something that's going to allow me to teach energy, especially energy in collisions, but they're going to discover that through the inquiry process. And so a phenomena, don't overthink it. It's simply an observable event in the natural world. In this case, it's these two objects falling on the table. So when they hit the table, one of them stops and the other one keeps bouncing. At that moment, the students will just start asking questions naturally. Like that's just what humans do is that we wonder about things that we don't understand. Anytime I do a lesson like this, I'll always video the phenomena. I'll put a link to this video down below if you want to use it. And the reason why is I can just loop that. If you right click on a YouTube video, you can just have it loop over and over and over again. I get rid of the sound and now this becomes a primary source. So the students can keep watching it and then I as a teacher can walk around and help with the inquiry process. Like have that video keep lo looping so that they can dig in. So. As we step through uh, inquiry, I'm going to be stepping through a set of these inquiry cards. So the first one you always start with is a phenomena. So there has to be something that we're trying to understand in the natural world. That's the first card. On the back side of that card, uh, it could be a problem. So sometimes we're not doing science, but we're doing engineering. We have a human problem. In that case, these cards would be design cards. But in, since we're doing this, uh, the wonder spheres, and it's something happening in the natural world, now we've got a phenomenon and we're really doing inquiry. The next set of cards are going to be blue, and those are based on the practices. So those are the practices in the next generation science standards. What those really are is they're telling the students what you're going to do. Uh, there are notes on the back of those for me as a teacher. And then finally, you have the green cards, which are going to be the cross-cutting concepts, and they're going to tell the students how to think. If we ever get stuck, those cross-cutting concepts will come in handy. And so I'm going to organize these inquiry cards like this. So we've got an inquiry cycle on the left side with the phenomena in the middle. Everything we're doing is always related to that phenomena, trying to figure out what's going on. The order we'll go in is asking questions, coming up with explanations, then we investigate, and finally we engage in argumentation. Now, it can bounce around. Lots of times we can ask questions that lead to a quick investigation, which maybe it's not l linear like this, um, but I've found that these four steps in this way is the best way to have uh, success when you're just starting to do inquiry. 
Now the words that will govern each of these steps is at the top of the card. And since the kids are driving the inquiry, you have to be good at asking questions as a teacher. And so when they're asking questions, the question or the prompt you're asking them is, what do you wonder? What are you, what are you noticing? What are you wondering about? We get to explanations, then it's what do you think? What do you think's going on? Then how do you investigate? And then how do you know? An explanation and an argument is different. An explanation is just what you think. An argument is now that I have evidence, is my uh, explanation right or wrong? So this is our inquiry steps. And let's start with asking questions. This is where I always begin. On the back of the card, it gives you a sequence of what you should do as a teacher. So these are the steps that you're going to do. Um, brainstorm questions first, classify them, and then improve. At the bottom of the card, you're gonna have a little rubric for what makes a good question. I'll dig more deeply into that on another video that's coming up on questions. But when your students are wondering, you wanna have that video playing so they can start asking questions. Generally what I'll do is I'll give them a whiteboard so they can start writing their questions down. Uh, maybe give them a first question, like why doesn't that one ball bounce could be the first question, but then tell them I want you to get eight questions. They'll always groan the first time because they've never been asked to generate a bunch of questions, but pretty soon they'll fall into it and they'll just start asking questions. When I'm doing lessons like this, I want it totally quiet when this is going on. I want each of the kids to individually be coming up with questions that they have, their initial wonderings. It'll take them a few minutes to get into it, but then they'll eventually take off. I also have some graphic organizers on asking questions you could use. Don't skip this step. This step is incredibly important. What they're really doing is as they're watching the phenomena, they're starting to make careful observations and they're seeing things that you wouldn't normally see. You're even having a hard time paying attention to me right now because this video is streaming down below and it kind of draws your attention. I've seen first graders spend like a half an hour just asking questions on an eight second video. So it's incredibly important to show them that. But once we've asked those questions, we want to value those questions. In elementary, lots of times those go on a wonder wall. In middle or high school, where they put those on a driving question board. And what that essentially says is the wondering is going to drive what we're going to do as far as experimentation goes. Now, after they've asked and brainstormed a bunch of questions, lots of time I want them to share those questions. So I'll have one student say, could you read your first question? I want everybody else in the class to listen to that question. If you have it, cross it off your list so you don't ask the same question twice and go to everybody, pull one question for each person. It gets everyone invested in the inquiry that we're about to do. Um, after they've done that, I'll classify their questions. The first time they're doing, they're probably not ready to do this, but each of the questions could be classified into one of the seven cross-cutting concepts. Most of their questions will be on cause and effect and structure and function. Sometimes they'll ask patterns questions, but not a bunch of patterns questions that are good questions over time or related to heat or related to energy. And they ask hardly any system questions in general. And so the key point is we want to classify those questions so we can see where the blind spot is. If they don't ask any questions about where energy and matter are going in the system itself, then we have a limited view of the phenomena. So now let's improve the questions. On the back of each of those green cards, I have other questions that you could use, just generic questions that you could use on any phenomena. Now we've kind of framed the question. The next step is let's figure out what our explanations are. What is everybody in the class thinking? An explanation is simply, what do you think? I'll use modeling or um, conceptual modeling to get at this, but we could also use mathematical modeling. We could use computational modeling. It's just tell me what you're thinking. It's easier for students when they're drawing models for you to frame the system. What's the system that we're modeling? So I could say, for example, the system is going to be the two wonder spheres, the table, and the distance between the two. Uh, and then the surroundings is going to be everything around the outside of it. So outside of that is the surroundings. When they draw their uh, system models now, they're going to be more accurate. They're not just going to draw a picture of what they think is on the inside of the sphere. Now we're going to let them draw. So these would be fourth grade drawings. This person thinks that energy disappears as it goes into the table. This person thinks that maybe there's sand on the inside of it and the other one's hollow. This person thinks it has something to do with the surface that it's landing on. And so what I can see when the students are modeling is I see what's inside each of their brains. And that's how I define what a model is. A model is just the idea you have in your brain, but get it outside your brain so other people can see it. Lots of times making it visual in addition to the words is gonna help, but we don't want it to be a diagram. So you may wanna use the cause and effect as a uh, cross-cutting concept um, to kind of help frame that. Tell them, I want one sentence on your model that tells me what you think is causing this phenomena. Now, as I look at those sentences, I can start to pull apart what everybody's thinking. Now, you might be thinking this sounds a lot like a hypothesis. It totally is. An explanatory model and an explanatory hypothesis are the same thing. 
a scientist is going to be way fam more familiar with what a model is and testing that model. Lots of times, if we're talking about a hypothesis, it's just kind of a guess, but there's no explanatory power found inside it. What I can go and do now as a teacher is I write down all of the different causes that are in the models. If I have to get ready for the lab that's coming up the next day, then I can kind of get material ready for that. But the idea of inquiry is now we have all these explanations in the class. We have to test them. So what investigations do we do? We investigate these models to see if they're right or if they're wrong. And so I always want students to plan their investigation before they do it. And so if they think there has something to do with energy loss, I want them to come to me and describe what kind of an investigation they're going to do. Before I ever give them the equipment, I want them to tell me what they're thinking. So this would be an example of an investigation where they were looking at the surface that the objects fall on, and they found, surprisingly, that if you drop them on a real soft surface, they both bounce the same amount. So that's an interesting result. What's the next step? Now we have a whole bunch of evidence that we've collected. Now we got to engage in argumentation. And so what do we do with that? You know that the product is going to be claim, evidence, reasoning, but it's not the order or the process in which we do it. The way I do this in class is I'll have the kids make a CER poster. So they have their evidence and then they make a claim with reasoning. In this case, they're looking at how temperature affects the movement of the wonder spheres. And they find it's odd, but you find that the temperature affects it quite a bit. If we cool it down or we heat it up, that, that sphere that doesn't bounce starts to bounce. Once we put these posters up on the wall, now we can do argumentation. You as a teacher can walk around and we can do peer review of those argumentation posters as well. This practice, talking about argumentation, a lot of what I'm talking about here, I'm drawing from the argument-driven inquiry. They're really the gold standard of how to do this argumentation. They have wonderful templates that you could look at. And so what have we done? We've really started to understand energy. So we've explored now, and now it's okay for me to come in as a teacher and do some explanation. If I talk about collisions or motion energy or energy transfer, now they have something to ground it in. So don't let anyone tell you if you're doing inquiry, the kids are just going to somehow discover things on their own. You have to be there guiding that process. But it's really important that you get a good phenomena. That phenomena has to tie to the standard so that we're not wasting time. I've got a bunch of them on my website, The Wonder of Science, along with PDFs of all of the forms that I was just showing you. My logo gets at the big steps of inquiry um, and it's supposed to look like a light bulb. But the idea is that when you see something you don't understand, the first thing you do is you wonder about it. I wonder why that occurs. Then you try to tell people what you're thinking. A model, a visual model is a good way to do that. Next step, let's get some evidence, gather more evidence, look at other people's evidence, and finally we can come up with a better idea of what's going on. So that's inquiry. It's a wonderful way to teach. I can't tell you how many lessons I've done and how impressed I've been with students, but I hope that was helpful.